Hello, and welcome to Don Bryan's Storytime. I'm your host, Don Bryan. You may remember me from fencing or taking naps. It had been my intention this morning to tell you a story straight out of the Bible. Uh, unfortunately, I had loaned my Bible to a very lovely pilgrim couple, which meant that I needed to borrow a Bible myself from a friend of mine. Uh, the Bible my friend gave me turned out to be a Protestant Bible, so that's been burned and my friend imprisoned, obviously. And we're going to have to switch to my backup story, which is about King Nuatha of the Duatha de Dinan. Uh, note that I will be telling you this story, which is primarily oral, with the aid of um, a felt board and props, or if you're watching Andalorel, threadless applique. Background. The Tuatha de Danann are nearly supernatural entities of early Ireland. They're basically the proto-Irish pantheon. They show up in Ireland near the end of the rule of the Fearbolg, who really aren't part of the story, don't worry about them. And they bring treasures like you only get in this kind of story, like a rock that screams when the rightful king of Ireland sits on it. Stuff like that. According to one legend, the Tuatha de Danann came to the shores of Ireland from boats from the north, uh, which they promptly set fire to because it's never too early in history to flex. That's one story of how they got there. There are other theories that we're not going to get into today. Where all of the legends agree are that the Tuatha de Danann were skilled warriors and druids of great power. They displaced the Fearbolg and ruled much of Ireland until the arrival of the Milesians, the first group of humans to come to the island. The Milesians eventually pushed the Tuatha de Danann into the hills and fairy rings of Ireland which is why, to this day, if you're there, you can only gamble if you're within a circle of standing stones. <clears throat> now, King Nuaha. This story is actually about him. Nuaha was a great king of the Tuatha de Danann, and he led them in battle against the Fearbolg when they first arrived in Ireland. Unfortunately, in a battle near what would become the king's stronghold of Terra, Nuaha got his arm cut off, and the law of the Tuatha de Danann says that you can only be king if you are a perfect physical specimen. So as king, Nuatha is out, and a man named Brez the Beautiful is in. Brez turned out to be not a great king. He made a side deal with the Formorians. He was half Formorians, and the Formorians basically are the, the dark pantheon of pagan Ireland. If the Tuatha de Danann are the gods of enlightenment, civilization, education, the Formorians are the gods of death, destruction, chaos, stuff like that. Brez gave the Formorians great power and influence over the land, and more or less enslaved the Tuatha de Danann, making them uh, carry firewood, dig ditches, stuff like that. Uh, for more on the Brez years, um, let me suggest the third act of a lovely documentary that was um, animated and released on video in 1994. Near the middle of Brez's reign, uh, the bard Kerb, freaking autocorrect, I said bard, bard. <sighs> Sorry. Anyway, Carib arrived at Brez's fort expecting the traditional hospitality that you would show to poets at the time. Instead, he was housed in a dark little shack with three small cakes to eat and then basically kicked out the very next morning. As he was leaving Terra, he composed the first satirical poem in Ireland, which cursed Brez and basically was the beginning of the end of Brez's reign. Side note, you can always tell in mythology when the bards get to write these stories without a lot of editorial oversight, because you get tales like this, which might as well be called, Be nice to your bards, or we will end your reign through song, so there, ha ha. Bards rule. <clears throat> Back to it. So, the Tuatha de Danann were now prepared to rebel against Brez, but they don't have somebody to replace him with. Nuatha was still around, but only has one arm, so he can't be king perfect physical specimen, or no kingship for you. He does have a physician. His physician's name is Dian Kecht. Uh, Dian Kecht has a son who's also a physician, that's Miak, and they are basically the Jor-El and Kal-El of Druidic medicine. Uh, Miak, the son, is a great and selfless medical practitioner, and his father, Dian Kecht, is a pretty decent doctor and also a terrible, terrible, terrible dad. Dian Kecht replaced Nuatha's missing arm with a silver one. I know it looks white. Heraldically, it's silver. <clears throat> Somehow that's not good enough. So Dian Kecht's son Miak undertakes to restore Nuatha's actual arm, which fortunately had been embalmed and preserved. 
Miyok replaced Nuatha's actual flesh arm and he said incantations over it for nine days. They recorded the incantation and it went sinew to sinew and joint to joint, joint to joint and sinew to sinew, sinew to sinew and joint to joint, joint to joint and sinew to sinew, sinew to sinew and joint to joint. Okay, I'm done. He did that for nine days. I did that for 10 seconds. This restores Nuatha's arm and he's free to be king again. Side note. Uh, Brez becomes exiled and basically kicks around for a few years, being kind of an ineffectual pain in the butt. But there is one outstanding moment where he goes to his father, who's king of the Formorians, half Formorian, remember, uh, looking for help retaking his throne, and gets told off by the most quotable Formorian in history, who says, you have no right to get it by injustice when you could not keep it by justice. Scholars believe this is the first time the member of an audience anywhere has said, oh, snap! If I'm honest, we don't know. The documentation on that is then. Dion Kex, terrible father, is overcome with jealousy at Miyok's skill as a healer and kills him in a scene of what had to be absolute hilarity as he kept striking at Miyok, who kept on healing himself. Strike and heal and strike and heal and strike and heal and strike and heal. Until finally Miyok's brain was struck totally clear of his body and he fell to the ground to rise no more. I was going to make felt pieces for this, but everybody watching this is in the SCA, and let's be honest, you've seen that fight, and you know it. Interestingly, it doesn't seem like Dian Keck received any sorts of consequences from this behavior, which uh, seems like kind of an oversight injustice to me, but whatever. Dian Keck buried Miak in a field outside of Terra. The next day, Miak's sister, Erm, who was coming to mourn her brother, found 365 different herbs growing in the shape of Miak's body, each one with special powers relating to the part of the body it was growing in place of. Head work for headaches, thumbs bane for removing thumbs, and most importantly, foot mint. Dian Kek uh, still wasn't done being a terrible dad, though, and as Ermd was sorting the herbs under her cloak for categorization and drying, uh, he grabbed the cloak, scattered the herbs to the four winds, mixed them all up forever so that they were impossible to sort. To this day, we don't know all of the healing properties of various herbs, and the um, essential oils business just can't quite seem to grab the FDA approval that it's looking for. That's the story of how one uppity bard brought down a king and caused medicine to be set back for a thousand plus years. Thank you for joining me on this trip through Celtic Lunacy. If you'd like to learn more about the Tuatha Dé Danann, there's plenty of stuff out there on Google Books and Britannica.com. If you're like me, though, and prefer your fairy content to have no educational value whatsoever, let me suggest Mike Magnolia's Hellboy, which has several later arcs about a reluctant Prince of Hell fighting the Morrigan after being bound to Earth by Rasputin, who was working with Nazis at the time, or Karen Marie Moaning's Highlander series, which primarily features modern women being flung back in time so they can shag berries. Thank you, and stay safe. See you next time.